hand sanitizer and masks aren't the only commodities that flew off the shelves during this pandemic. Global weapons sales hit a record $531 billion in 2020. That's a 1.3% increase on the previous year, despite the global economic downturn. According to a recent report by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, increased government spending on military hardware is what kept the industry afloat. The US, China, Russia, India and Britain remain the five biggest spenders, together accounting for more than 62% of all global military expenditure. Rising tensions with Russia on Europe's Eastern Front, as well as continued friction with China in the Pacific, are some of the reasons behind this splurge on weapons. But critics suggest there are better things to spend money on during a global pandemic. So what triggered the hike in arms sales? And could that money be better spent elsewhere? And to discuss that, joining me now from London is Elizabeth Bro. She's a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and from Yorkshire, England. Owen Green, he's a professor of international security and development at the University of Bradford. A warm welcome to you both. Owen, help us understand the reasons behind this surge in global arms sales despite the um, crashing impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, I think... The underlying reason is the increase in geostrategic tensions since 2013, 2014. The COVID epidemic has certainly put a lot of strain on budgets and there's going to be increasing pressure to cut military expenditure, but it has only an indirect effect on um, arms transfers and sales. Often these are built in and have it take some time to respond. And in the end, uh, some of the big uh, spenders and transferers um, take, give much higher priority to um, arms transfers and you know, making sure their defence capabilities are up to scratch than um, diverting it to the pandemic. Mm, so, Elizabeth, uh, do you agree with Owen? How do you explain this trend? Yeah, so as, as he mentioned, uh, arms sales are planned, yeah, well, they, they are uh, concluded and then carried out uh, over a period of years. So it's not like you can uh, take some money from an ongoing uh, arms contract and divert it to something else. But on top of that, what's happening is that uh, European countries are increasing their defense spending. And that's been going on for for a few years now, and they are increasing it uh, in response to to, to uh, uh, Russian uh, Russia's assertive uh, posture, let's say, or mm -hmm. others would say aggression, uh, and they are increasing it uh, uh, to uh, try to reach the two percent goal that NATO uh, member states have set themselves. So uh, that's sort of a, a little bit of a contradiction. On one hand, uh, they they uh, should be spending a lot on on fighting the pandemic. On the other hand, they have promised to spend two percent on defence. Uh, as part of being members of NATO. So, uh, Owen, it seems disruptions in supply chains did not affect the arms sales. Uh, how has the sector proved immune to this very <laughs> virus? I think underneath it all, probably they're still... Uh, some of the suppliers are going to be suffering from the uh, lack of microchips. But I think they're specialist suppliers and um, there is a sort of um, momentum in the chain. I mean, in addition to what was just said, the Central European countries, in particular, the Eastern Central European countries, expend increasing their expenditure. There have been really big expenditures in the Far East and in the Middle East, too, um, with Egypt and Algeria. So, uh, Elizabeth, in much of the world, as we've just uh, mentioned, military spending grew and governments are even ex have accelerated payments uh, to the arms industry. In order to mitigate the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, how is it going to play out? Well, that's that's uh, what we're facing now. So during during the the worst months of the pandemic, governments spent enormous amounts of money that they really didn't have. They they used up all the margins or the savings, uh, such as they were, that countries had. And now we are facing the bill for for that extraordinary effort. And so I think we'll see the effect, or not just I think, we'll uh, clearly see the effect of the pandemic on uh, public finances for a long time to come. And, and it, it may um, affect arms, uh, arms spending as well. So while uh, spending has continued mm. apace during the past uh, 24 months or so, uh, it may uh, change in, in the next few years uh, and for the worse if, if, you're, if you're an arms contractor. 
So, Owen, can you talk about uh, talk to us about the political influence these big arms companies have on the countries and uh, administrations? I mean, how effective is lobbying, and where do you think the uh, politics stand? I mean, defense industries are extraordinarily effective at lobbying their own governments. It's partly because they can always argue that this is a national security priority and therefore, in a sense, have certain immunity from other pressures. And those, mm -hmm. that lobbying really matters. Now, the form of that lobbying really changes according to country. So in the US, it's well established in terms of congressional districts and so on. They're very effective at that. Whereas with China and uh, Russia, for example, and India, it's much more uh, um, a sort of elite military industrial complex that, um, uh, that has a great weight in political decision making, similarly in the Middle East. So, uh, Elizabeth, how have India and China climbed the ladder? I mean, what's uh, behind their success? So what really stands out in this uh, most recent CIPRI report is Russia's continued decline in arms, mm. arms exports. And uh, what also stands out is that China is doing exceptionally well in its arms exports. And I think it can be explained by mostly one thing, the technological advance in arms manufacturing. Uh, arms today are, are very far from the, the, uh, the uh, tanks we remember from, from the Cold War. They are very technologically sophisticated. And China has um, a, a, an enormous and growing technology sector, as of course does the United States, as do Western European countries. And if I may add, so to uh, a pretty high extent, a uh, large extent, that's Turkey. Russia doesn't really have that in the same way. And so I think if we look at uh, major trends in arms manufacturing, arms exports, Russia will continue to, to lag behind uh, as the years go by. So, Owen, where does Turkey stand in this arms race? I mean, although a relative latecomer to this arms industry, what kind of an impact have the Turkish drones had on this industry? Or is it big or is it just a drop in the ocean at the moment? No, I think it's significant. I mean, uh, Turkey is a middle rank player in these issues. But if you're talking about, uh, there's, there are various ways of uh, establishing significance. One is just size, scale, wealth as a value. But the other one is impact in terms of the impact of military sales. And of course, Turkish drone sales to Azerbaijan uh, and supplies uh, famously made a really big difference to the Armenia-Azerbaijan dispute recently. Or um, And uh, so I think uh, in certain sectors, uh, Turkish supply, um, arms industries and arms transfers are booming, particularly in the drone sector. I think more generally, there's the issue of there's the scale of arms, but there's also the willingness to supply to uh, de destinations which otherwise cannot easily get supply. And so Russia, for example, continues to be a very significant player when it comes to supplying weapons that, to countries that the West would prefer they wouldn't. And I think Turkey is trying to navigate that. Obviously, Turkey is a member of NATO, but at the same time, it's become an increasingly assertive semi-autonomous member of NATO in this, in this sort of respect. And so it's trying to carve its way through. Uh, what's your take on that, uh, Elizabeth? What would you like to say on that? That's absolutely true. I, I, I love the expression semi-autonomous, <laughs> but um, it, it is very interesting to see that, that uh, Turkey is really taking on uh, Russia uh, in countries, uh, in let's say developing countries, where Russia has has a, had a long-standing advantage, going back even to to Soviet days when the Soviet Union uh, built extremely good relationships, for example, in African countries that Russia has continued to build on um, less, maybe politically, than when it comes to, to arms sales. And and now uh, Turkey is um, essentially uh, looking at those countries and and getting. Um, getting friendly vibes from them. So are you suggesting, uh, are you suggesting that uh, Turkey and Russia will one day confront one another because of the arms sales? Because we know that Turkey is coming to the fore, especially in Africa. I, I don't think they'll con confront each other militarily in Africa, but certainly there, there are sales uh, salespeople will confront each other in Africa. Mm -hmm. So, and Oven, now that the most of the Arab and Gulf countries are normalizing their relations, could this signal a decrease in terms of the imports in the middle term? Or they, this trend will continue? 
Unfortunately, I think the trend in terms of sales to the Middle East is going to continue. There's a lot of uh, capacity to buy there, and the insecurity is extremely great. And as geostrategic competition mounts up, then obviously there'll be um, enhanced sort of politics behind the arms sales from China, Russia, um, and the West, uh, and other players too. So I'm afraid I think that's going to increase, and it will be destabilizing. Oh, just uh, just uh, one last question, just uh, change of region, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, the Asia-Pacific region was the largest importing uh, region for major ar uh, arms. Is this the right way uh, to counter Chinese influence? Well, I think each country in the region will say, well, we, we have to do our bit and, and we have to look after our country. But what was really interesting in the Asia Pacific region in the past year was, of course, Australia deciding to, mm -hmm. to cancel its submarine contract with France. And France, of course, reacting furiously. It was a major contract. And, and French arms uh, sales are, um, well, it's a mixed bag and it's not an unmitigated success. And so France, the French government, always tries very hard to promote its uh, defense companies. And in, uh, on this occasion, uh, it was a, a deal that they thought they had in the bag. And then Australia canceled it in favor of, of uh, a deal with, with the United yeah. States and, and the UK. And uh, that, of course, got an extremely angry reaction from, from France. All right, Elizabeth and Owen, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining me on Straight Talk.